Welcome to the Valve Studio. This is a continuation of our guitar pinto preamp discussion. In the first half, we looked at the literature and we discovered this value called K and how it was uh, chosen to optimize the selection of the uh, operating point for um, the lowest distortion. And there's a, we presented a couple papers uh, one on how to minimize, how to choose K for minimal intermodulation distortion, as well as this idea called a dynamic characteristic and, and how that's critical for when you want to operate your pentode to get various um, characteristics out of your amplifier. And uh, we'll, we will um, um, talk a little bit more about the circuit I'm going to create here uh, in future episodes to actually be able to replicate that dynamic characteristic for our 6AU6 uh, pentode in the preamplifier. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and switch over to my screen here. <clears throat> um, we're down here to uh, part 1B. We're going to fire up our analog discovery and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about uh, harmonic distortion. And let me tip my camera here a little bit. There we go. All right, so we're going to talk about harmonic distortion, and we're also going to talk about intermodulation because the analog discovery is very good at creating all these test signals, and we're going to look at them on the spectrum analyzer as well as the um, uh, audio-wise. We, we have our output uh, piped into the sound uh, system here in the Valve Studio as well as the sound card on this particular PC. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Part one, um, let me go ahead and show you how I have the analog discovery set up. If we look at this photograph here on the right hand side, we are on analog output one and it's looped around to analog input one and we're teed off into uh, two additional tees. That red lead uh, goes up to the sound card on the PC you're watching and the other lead runs over to the audio amplifier here in the lab. All right, first thing is we're going to go over and talk about uh, the waveform generator in the analog discovery. It allows you to create custom waveforms itself. Remember, in the for intermodulation, we're going to use that Cohen 3-4 mechanism, uh, you know, procedure, which is actually takes the harmonic, the fundamental, uh, the two fundamentals for intermodulation product and it sets them at um, intervals of three and four. So if we pick 3000 Hertz and 4000 Hertz, what that does is it makes the intermodulation components on the spectrum actually pop out as well as the intermodulation pop out at specific frequencies in increments of 1000. Very clever way of doing it. All right, first thing we have is a, a clean three kilohertz sine wave um, with no distortion. Well, we don't know if it's no, no distortion yet. Let's um, turn it on here and we'll bring up the spectrum analyzer. So over here I have the cursor turned on. So our peak right here is sitting right around three kilohertz. So we'll bring up this thing in the front and um, the first thing we're going to look at is harmonic distortion. So we're at three kilohertz here. And what I'm going to show you is symmetric distortion. If you're going to, um, and let me turn this off a minute. If you're going to, uh, how do we take that sine wave function? Let me, let me show you this here. The function in this custom function just says nothing more than uh, sine is equal to six times pi times x. How do we actually uh, apply a distortion function to that sine wave and have uh, waveforms actually generate the distortion for us. If we look at the um, this dynamic characteristic of a pentode, you'll see that there is a, a portion here that you want to choose for your operation, but then there's a, a sloping line that kind of goes that uh, is asymptotic as well as another sloping line down here on the bottom. And the function that actually models this, you know, in some fashion is uh, arctangent. 
Um, so here's the arctangent of the arctangent function itself from minus 5 to 5, actually minus 20 to 20. And it's you can kind of see that we have the same uh, asymptote on the high side as the low side. So what we're going to do in the analog discovery is uh, um, run our sine wave through arctangent. And arctangent is actually going to apply a little bit of distortion. And by doing this, we can not only create distortion, we can effectively simulate um, this dynamic characteristic because we can choose to be in the center of this of a of a function like this, or we can choose to be offset a little bit. And why we want to do that is if we're in the center and our waveform it becomes distorted because of this top curve and the bottom curve we'll get symmetric distortion. And symmetric distortion in amplifiers uh, results in odd harmonics. So we'll have, you know, one kilohertz, three kilohertz, five kilohertz, that kind of thing. Actually, in our case, it's three kilohertz, nine kilohertz, and um, 15 kilohertz. But if we choose our operating point such that we are near one end of our curve, then we will get asymmetric distortion and that will create primarily one second harmonic and the rest of the harmonics will be almost zero. We're gonna go ahead and show you that right now. Um, the, let me see here, over on my waveform generator. Is this where I am? No, that's the custom, okay. So let's look at first the um, symmetric. The symmetric function itself, you can kind of see here that we go ahead and take our amplitude of sine and amplitude, amplify it a little bit by uh, 1.5, 150%, and then we run that through our tangent. And what that does is it creates a waveform that looks like this. So this has got uh, even distortion on the, on, uh, the uh, the peak as well as the trough. Here's here's what a sine wave actually looks like, and here's what a um, sine wave with symmetric distortion looks like. So let's go ahead and turn on the sine wave again. Right, so let's look at the harmonics here. This is our three kilohertz um, sine wave. Here is our third, which is now at nine kilohertz. Here's our fifth at 15. And here is our seventh at, no, we have something else, 19. 19. All right, so. I believe that this is an artifact that's not related to the harmonics. Let's change our um, scale here and turn this on again. Nope. Oh, here. No, it was, it, yeah, our scale was wrong. Here's three. Third is nine. Fifth is 15. And the seventh is at 21. All right. <clears throat> well, that is symmetric distortion. And we will, um, here's asymmetric distortion. Let me turn this off over here. This is asymmetric distortion. So what we do is, here's our function here. We're actually taking the sine wave and we're making the amplitude a little bit lower and then we're shifting it uh, basically shifting the bias point or the operating point on the arctangent curve and we're moving it down. And what that does is it makes the top half of the wave look like a sine wave and then the bottom half is the one that gets distorted. And this is a, a um, common thing in a tube amplifier as you end up 
reaching the more negative portions of the up of the um, plate characteristic. So when you're down, when you're down in this region here, operating in this region, you end up these lines get crunched together, and so you get uh, distortion on the bottom half of the of the uh, your sine wave. All right, so let's get this going and take a look at the spectrum here. We'll turn on our linear, our our nonlinear asymmetric distortion, and we're back out of 50 kilohertz. I'm going to change this back to 20. All right, here's our fundamentals at three, and here is one at six. Now that's the second harmonic, and we have a little another little one over here at nine. So this is the third. Now, if you, now you notice that there are no other harmonics at all, just these two. And the second is the primary one. And it is down, this is at uh, minus uh, about three dB, and this one's minus 21. So there's 18 B dif dB difference here, and eight, 18 down to 43 is, 25 dB. So this is quite a significant, this is like a thousand times smaller than the second. So our second harmonic is the primary component in asymmetric distortion. And this is the one that's pleasing. So when we design our preamplifier stage, we want to um, operate in this particular part of the dynamic characteristic. Well, let me turn this off. This is going to drive us all nuts. So when we choose our operating point here for optimal performance for as low distortion as we want, if we were designing an audio amplifier, we would pick somewhere in the middle. If we don't want that and we want it as the guitar, as the guitar is turned up louder, we want to cross either this boundary up here or this one down here. And we get to choose how fast it actually happens by choosing the screen voltage. And this particular um, graph for a SJ7 only goes up to a, a grid voltage of 100. Remember, our 6AU6 has a maximum uh, screen voltage of 330. So. All right, let's look at, that's uh, harmonic distortion. I'm going to go ahead and play those again for you so that you can get an idea of what that sounds like. We will turn on the, the, the clean one. The asymmetric one. And the symmetric one. Now, is this warm? I don't know. <laughs> uh, let's go talk about the intermodulation distortion. So here's three. Here's four. We're going to mix those two together with this, with this function here. So I'm going to turn this off. Let's take a look at what this function says here. This function says that we're doing sine of 8 pi x, which is our four uh, multiple of 4 plus sine of 3 pi x, which is our multiple of 3. All right, let's turn this on. All right, this is what this waveform looks like when you add a 3 and 4 um, kilohertz um, sine waves together. And if you look at the spectrum over here, it's really clean. This is what the, the analog discovery module is great. Look at this. We have almost 60 dB of attenuation on the noise, and we have literally nothing except for our two uh, our two frequencies. The th here's the three, and here's the four. Now we're going to apply that same arctangent function in a little different proportions, um, and we're going to show you the impact of of the harmonic distortion and the components that it actually creates. 
The first one is, we'll look at this function here, and it goes and it, it takes our arctangent function again and takes our addition of these two sine waves together and multiplies it by 0.25. And what that does is make the amplitude smaller. So on the, on the, this particular waveform here, we're actually running way down in here. So we're down, let's, let's change this to minus one here. Okay, so we're actually running down where our amplitude is going to be about 0.25. So we're we're running in this particular region on the arc tangent curve. But you know this looks fairly linear down in here, but you're going to see that it's actually not. And then eventually we're going to run back up to to having a gain of one, which will be on this curve. So you know this slight amount of curve on arc tangent actually creates a lot of of harmonics for intermodulation. All right, let's go back over here. So here is our two. Um, oh, so the gain of one basically does the exact same thing, except for this multiplier out here makes it so that it's it's um, the, the two signals added together. And you can kind of see that. Look at the waveform differences. Here's here's no dis no distortion. Here's a little bit of nonlinear distortion and here is a lot of nonlinear distortion. Now we don't have the uh, the asymmetric version of this. We're only going to talk about the symmetric one and um, I, I didn't get a chance to wire that up. We, we can do that right here if we want and kind of see what the impact is. Let's go ahead and do that. All right, here's the two. All right, let's first talk about a little bit of, of nonlinearity applied to our two uh, frequencies. So look at what was created. We got a three. Here's our three and our four. Here is our not our, this is now this is 10 and this is 11. So if you look at that or that paper, you know, we're out here, we're, we're at some multiple that got created because of a third or fourth order um, intermodulation component. And these ones down here, these, these ones around our frequency are the third order, which is 2F2 minus F1 and 2F1 minus F2. So that's what these two components are. And this one here is at nine. So that is going to ultimately be this one, which is 2F, no, it's, well, it's a little hard to say, but what you can kind of see that we're starting to get these particular um, um, additional signals to our uh, two pure frequencies. Let's turn on the, uh, let's, let's go ahead and turn up the gain a little bit on our thing here, and we'll take one more measurement. Now you're going to get to see a lot of interesting things. Now this this is showing you that we started out with two frequencies and now we have in in the band okay let's change this back to 20 kilohertz so we can think kind of think about it in those terms let's run this again all right so look at what we got in this is in the audio in the audio band we started with three and four but we have one at one two three four Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Kind of see it there. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. So we have nineteen components now because we have a nonlinear phase, a nonlinear stage that's creating intermodulation um, distortion. What are we going to do about that? Well. It turns out that on an audio amplifier, we want to be clean. You want to go ahead and pick all your uh, uh, gains so that you kind of avoid intermodulation distortion. And that's what we're talking about. That's what this whole paper is talking about. 
is ways to minimize your intermodulation distortion. And that's what all these curves are down here is a curve of where do we, let's change the, the K value and pick our intermodulation distortion such that we have a specific gain and we have a specific intermodulation distortion. So this one here, we can get a gain of almost 100 if we choose our uh, um, screen voltage to be 10 and our intermodulation distortion is almost zero. All right. <clears throat> And this is for a second stage grid um, grid leak resistor of 400K. And you can, now you can kind of see the power of these this particular paper in the fact that we he goes and he looks at the gains. He looks at the impact of what the grid resistor is in the second stage versus the performance of the first stage and where you pick the bias point for the first stage. That's what makes this thing completely a really valuable paper. Now, this is all for a 6SJ7. Do we have that? No. Now what are we going to do? Well, we're going to go over to here again, and we need to create a circuit to actually be able to create this particular kind of curve and we also want to be able to we want to be able to choose our grid our screen our screen grid bias voltage we also want to be able to change our plate voltage our plate resistor and our grid voltage and the swing at which we want to swing so that we can create this graph and at the same time we want to go in and take enough data that we can create this kind of graph for our guitar amplifier. Now, here's an, another interesting um, point about guitar amplifiers. We talked about audio amplifiers and minimizing intermodulation distortion. On a guitar amplifier, when you play particular notes, like uh, two, two notes together or three notes together, you're going to create these components. And you get subharmonics of your fundamentals. And what this does, depending on the, the frequency at which your, you, the strings you've plucked, the notes you've, you've played, you may get subharmonics of that at, at an interval such that it makes the chord sound fuller than if it did with no intermodulation distortion. So when you design the bias point for these pentode stages, you get complete flexibility on how much intermodulation distortion you can introduce into the preamp stage and intentionally induce intermodulation distortion and make your um, certain types of play sound fuller than if there was no distortion at all. That's very interesting. Now, are we going to be able to do that here? Not today, but that's the whole point of designing this pentode stage for AJ's amplifier. All right, let's go over to the circuit here, uh, and that is going to be, where is it? It's not in that one. It's not in that one. <laughs> All right, you're right here. Here we go. Here's our device under test. This is a 6AU6. And I have, like I said in the previous video, I have now a plate power supply that go from 0 to 1,000 volts. And I have a screen power supply that will also go from 0 to 1,000 volts. Now, our 6AU6 will only handle 200, uh, 330 volts for both of those. And our circuit's going to accommodate that we can switch out this plate resistor as well as the screen resistor. And um, with the 82, the uh, analog inputs have a voltage range of plus or minus 25 volts. If you look at the manual, it says there's a protection diode in that clamps at 50 volts. And if you get beyond 25, you are going to uh, begin to clamp and it's going to affect your readings. So uh, I purchased some 100X probes and that's going to allow me, well, a, a 10X probe is going to allow you to go to 250 volts plus and minus. Uh, but we want to potentially go up to, you know, like 500 volts for doing, you know, power output tubes. So I got some uh, 100X probes, which will make it so that the 82 will measure up to 2,500 volts. Um, 
which is a little bit scary. <laughs> All right, if you look at this this uh, this characteristic curve, you'll see that the this grid voltage here um, goes beyond five volts, minus five volts, the magnet, the um, the um, the DC point. Um, the analog output on the analog discovery only goes to plus and minus five. That's the absolute maximum. You can pick the DC bias point in the middle there, and uh, then you can r and, um, run an AC component on top of a DC, but the combination of the two will only go to five volts. So I started investigating um, high voltage um, preamplifiers, and uh, the LTC uh, 6090 is a 140 volt CMOS reel to reel output op amp from Linear. Um, and uh, this thing is this thing is awesome. <laughs> I ended up uh, um, sending an email over to my rep, Rich, there in Denver, and I said, "Hey, can I get the evaluation board for this thing?" And he says, "Yeah, we'll send that over to you." Now, here's the schematic for the evaluation board. Here's the LTC 6090, and you'll see that it's powered on plus 65 and minus 65, minus 62 down here. And uh, how do they get that? Well, they've also included an LT8300, which is a switching power supply, and they have a transformer up here, and they generate on the same board, the same evaluation board, the plus and minus supplies to make this thing so we have great, you know, great, this thing is a swinging thing. It'll do almost 135, 140 volts swing. It has a programmable gain stage down here. It's got a jumper that'll set the 20. It'll be 20x or 1x. Um, it turns out 20x for our applications a little too high. Uh, so there's there's ways I can adjust that. If you have it on the 1x, it takes a feedback resistor and, and makes it so that this is basically a gain of one. The 20 actually introduces this 100k into the circuit, and we get 20x itself. So with that, we can amplify really small voltages to really large voltages, which is great. And so what we're going to do is um, we are going to run that, uh, the output, into a voltage divider here because the analog discovery uh, well, works a lot better if the amplitude of the A out is, is, is high. Um, uh, they talk about this in the manual. You know, it's the, the, uh, the distortion characteristics are better if you have larger voltages. Um, we're going to take the evaluation board and run this right in there. And we have a voltage divider up at the front so we can set our gains correctly. And we're going to leave it on. Um, this is how we're going to work with the gain. So gain of 20x down here. We're going to divide that down and get it all set up so that we can get out like up to minus 70 volts. Uh, we need that for if we want to do, um, uh, you know, power pintodes or something like that for the bias. And we, just, we run that right back into the grid on the pintode. And um, so let me uh, stop here. I got to reset the cameras and we will pick it up in just a minute right from this point. Hold on. All right, I'm back. Got a 30 limit on this thing. I'm too wordy. <laughs> All right, so here's our, our 686. So from here, we're going to be able to bias this both positive and negative, which is a benefit if we want to do AB2 or A2 type designs in a um, in the small signal thing we don't want to run um, a positive grid voltage because we don't want that current to to um, burn up our grid uh, we can connect our our, our um, grid leak resistor to the grid itself or up front of the grid the grid stop resistor and if we want to look at the performance characteristics of this we have the provision to have our cathode actually grounded and do uh, fixed biasing or we can click it back over here to have incorporating the RK, uh, the cathode bias resistor in the circuit, as well as um, our cathode bypass capacitor here, CK. Uh, we have our option to um, incorporate in um, the screen capacitor or not. Um, so we're pretty flexible in what we can do with this particular circuit. Now, our goal, on that, remember, is if I can 
we, we want to recreate this particular graph. And we want to choose our operating point. So we want to go through here and we want to choose our operating point based on this type of, of curve. And we want to be able to, by changing the grid current, I mean the plate current, we can move around here and pick our intermodulation distortion component. We can also pick our gain. And when we get done with that, we can apply an AC signal to this and uh, impose a very clean single frequency onto our circuit and look at the, the harmonic distortion as well as the, um, inter, well, not the intermodulation. We can look at harmonic distortion with a single frequency and then on the, on the AD2 we can, we can output two frequencies or three or four or whatever that is right into there and look at the intermodulation component as well. This is a very powerful circuit that we're going to work on in the future. And so I'm going to go back and we will um, turn the thing on and we'll go listen to intermodulation as well as harmonic distortion and I'll close out there. You could kind of watch along here on the screen. All right, well, there you have it. Uh, we have a lot of work cut out for us. Uh, fortunately, I do have the, um, the DC 1979, which is the evaluation kit for that LT6090. I have my analog discovery. We've looked at the, the, um, the uh, frequency components of the analog output. It's very clean. It's got at least 65 dB of distortion-free performance for both single and two frequencies, probably as well as three, uh, or as many as you want. So we can get, we can use it for very clean frequency generation. And with the combination of the analog discovery with our LTC 6090, we're gonna be able to create a drive, a grid drive circuit that's gonna allow us to pick um, uh, the operating point, the, the grid bias point, by adjusting the DC bias on the grid. And now we can also change the, the screen voltage and choose which one of those curves we're actually gonna be on by changing the high voltage screen voltage from anywhere from uh, you know 10 up to, uh, in this case, uh, 330 volts. And we can change the, the plate voltage as well. So in uh, probably in the next episode, I'm going to think about how to actually do that with our pentode here. And we're going to try to recreate the dynamic characteristic for our 6AU6. And then we may get into um, measuring um, the intermodulation distortion as well as the total harmonic distortion for our single stage voltage preamp using a pinto for our guitar preamp all right well thanks for watching i know this has been long if you made it all the way through this um thank you for watching uh go ahead and read the references the two references uh that came out of this are the two references you need to go over are the choice of operating system for resistance coupled um resistance capacitance coupled pintodes that's the langford smith article and then there's the dynamic characteristics of of Pintodes by Hafner. All right, this is the Valve Studio for July 10th, 2017.